So great to be with you guys. Thanks for being here. Uh, we've, as you know, we've been in this series called Journey for uh, four weeks now. This is the fifth week <clears throat> of seven. And uh, we've been looking at the, the story of Moses because Moses and his life provide really great archetypes that can help us to better process the, the or better relate to the process, rather, of the of spiritual growth on our own journey. So, for example, Moses' life is full of, of these extreme contrasts, and our lives are too. In his case, he's born into slavery, but he's raised as royalty. So you might ask, well, how does that relate to us? But think about it. When you're born, you can do nothing for yourselves. You are under the rule of your parents, thank God, uh, for many years, right? And it gradually changes as you go. So you're like, you're born into slavery. But not only that, you're, you're born into a, a slavery to your own appetites, right? Like this morning, I got on the scale, made it very clear. I'm still in bondage to some of my appetites. So it does relate to us. And what's important to remember is that these things are contrasted with our potential to live as a prince or a princess of our father, the king. So Moses also shines a light on our propensity for things like courage and justice and even violence. Uh, when he comes across this Egyptian abusing a Hebrew, he defends the Hebrew. Uh, but then you'll notice that it's immediately flipped, that, that, that courage and, and a sense of justice, it's flipped. And all of a sudden, he's a, he's a cowardly criminal fleeing for, uh, fleeing for his life and from the law. So there's contrast. Now... His luxurious big city surroundings are all contrasted with this lonely shepherd's role in the desert. Here in that wilderness of, of you could call it the wilderness of humility and, and, uh, and solitude, Moses has this really profound mystical experience with God in the form of the burning bush. And these conditions of solitude are precisely the conditions that we need in our own lives in order for us to also encounter God the ways uh, that are really soul-shaping and life-changing. So let me just uh, quickly review what we've learned so far in this, in this series. In week one, we came to some important realizations. The first one was that we have to begin at some point, and that seems obvious, but here's the thing to remember, that even if our journey doesn't begin with a burning bush experience, a really great place to start our journey is a decision to follow Jesus. You cannot go wrong with that starting point. The second thing was on our journey, we need to be willing to take whatever the next step is in order to keep moving forward. So maybe for you it's a, a, a regular prayer life, or meditation, or serving others in need. And the third thing, on our journey, we can find a presence in the daily routine of life. In other words, when we work at these things and we work on this relationship with God through Christ, what happens is we, we can develop this ability to sense his presence and his holiness even in the things that we might otherwise think of as mundane and routine. Week two, we ask a question. Who's going to go with us on the journey? Pastor Larry said, God's going to go with us. The great I am, the ground of being. Now that ground of being comes to us in a lot of different ways. Maybe it's just as friends and encouragers along our journey who help us to hold up our staff when we're in need, just the way that Aaron and her did for, for Moses to help him keep his focus. And then we also will have mentors that bring wisdom and speak that wisdom into our lives uh, the way that Jethro did for Moses when his journey became overly burdensome. Third week, we looked at the potholes, the breakdowns, the setbacks that we will all inevitably face along our own journey. We learned some good ways to maintain the best attitude toward these encounters, though. The first one was avoid blaming others and simply take responsibility for the best response that you can have to whatever your circumstances are. We don't control very much, but we can control that. The other thing was to quit fixating on failures because failure doesn't have to be the end. It doesn't have to define us. 
And in fact, they are very often the important stepping stones along the journey. Last week, we considered the detours that we may have to take on the journey, will most likely take on the journey, in fact. Pastor Larry told us that just when it seems like there's no hope left, watch, God often provides a way. God often provides a way, though, that is the long way around, and there's a good reason for that. As free creatures, free-willed beings, it often takes time to shape the mind and the heart. And so those long ways around, they make sense. Today we're going to look at the benefits of something that I call the mile markers of faith along our journey. When I travel on the interstate, I look for the mile markers. Maybe you do too. I look for uh, exit 205, so that's a mile marker when I'm going to go to church. I look for 207 for home and so on. We have these mile markers because they help us to, re, to, to put into relationship where we are with where we're going. On our spiritual journey, the mile markers are things like events, uh, encounters, challenges along the way where we experience God's faithfulness in those circumstances. And they can become really important mile markers for us to look back on, too, and remember his faithfulness. In the story of Moses, there are many mile markers. You could say that the burning bush was mile marker number one. And then maybe the plagues and the crossing the Red Sea. All of these things they needed to look back on. There were others. I'm going to read now from Exodus chapter 16, and we'll take a look at some of those. It says there that Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites... In the evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of God. So the Israelites had left the oppression of Egypt because of God's calling for them to follow Moses. And they had a number of mile markers for themselves on this journey as well. But you'll notice that many of those, and this is important to remember, many of those mile markers marked events, occurrences in their lives that were very difficult. And that leads me to this first point. Following God may involve some difficulties and sacrifices, but it is definitely always worth it. The Hebrews had prayed to God to deliver them from Egypt. In response, God sent Moses. And then he led them from Egypt through the Red Sea and into this wilderness. When they went to Mara, they had a mile marker there. But the water was bitter. They complained. Then they camped at the oasis of Elam. Things were good there. Another mile marker. So they change. Some are good, some are difficult. They left the oasis, they moved back into the wilderness, and two and a half months down the road, they are very hungry, and they are sick and tired of going the long way around. What do they do? They begin to grumble. And they begin to grumble and blame Moses and Aaron. So, despite the fact that, that God was faithful to deliver them, just as they had asked, they complained about Moses and Aaron for their present circumstances anyway. Why is that? Because, oh, how soon we forget when things get tough. That's why. And this is exactly why the people are instructed to keep things like the Passover festival, for example, because it provides for them this memorial of God's faithfulness in their difficult circumstances. In fact, all of the Hebrew festivals remind them of two things, and both are very important. One is their former suffering. The other one is God's deliverance. He wants them to remember both. Because the reality is this, is, this helps to keep the people of God from looking back in the past and seeing only the good old days. Like, you know, I talk to my dad and he'll say, you know, they just don't build cars the way they used to. To which I respond, thank God. Because you were lucky if you got 50,000 miles on your car. I don't have to tune mine up until it hits 100,000. 
But we tend to do this. We look back and we say, oh, yeah, that was, things were better back then, the good old days. And this is uh, something that, that Pastor Larry refers to as the uh, if-only trap. The Israelites fell into this trap too. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. At least there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food that we wanted. And, but you, Moses, Aaron, you've led us out into, the, into this wilderness to starve this entire assembly to death. We often fall into the same trap. We, we'll, we'll find ourselves stewing over past decisions, let's say, and we have this regret and this discontent with our current circumstances. Think about it. Think about how often you do that. If only we had stayed where we were. We were so much happier back there. If only we had acted instead of just thinking about that investment. Oh, man. If only we had more time, more money, more respect from others. One time our son Ben, who's adopted from Korea, was watching videos about the prosperity of South Korea. And he was mad at us about something. Teenagers. So he comes out after watching this video. He says, if only I had been adopted by a Korean family. Because then I probably wouldn't be poor. He's got a point there. Right? And they have really great movie theaters, way better than ours. If only trap. See, the problem with this trap is when, when we allow for it, it keeps us stuck in past regrets. It keeps us in this attitude of discontent. And, and when we allow that, it also robs us of the joy that we could be experiencing in the present moment. So it's something to avoid. So what are the things that lead to the if-only trap? Well, it's things like regrets and guilt and pessimism, just general negativity. They often lead to the if-only trap. And in the spiritual life, this translates to a kind of second-guessing God. We start to doubt that God can actually act in our present circumstances. We may even start to doubt his, his intentions. Is God even good? So it's good to remember to look back at the mile markers where he was faithful in similar times. I used to pastor a small church in Venice where the average age was quite a bit higher than it is here at Suncoast. But, and consequently, I spent a lot of time in, on hospital calls. Um, on one occasion, I was called to make an emergency uh, visit for a guy named Ed. Ed was a very sweet immigrant from somewhere in Eastern Europe. I can't remember now where, where he's from, but thick accent, but just a guy that just loved Jesus with all of his heart. And they were telling me uh, that he was probably not going to make it another day, so I needed to get down there if I could as soon as possible. I didn't really want to go. I don't like hospital calls. So I called Pastor Kevin, and I said, hey, you want to go with me on this call? And he said, sure. When we got there, the scene was, it was disturbing. Uh, Ed had these tubes that were down his throat, and, and blood was being sucked out of his lungs, and, uh, and tubes in his arms replacing it, um, and he seemed to be writhing in pain or some kind of suffering. We weren't sure if he was conscious that we were there or not. I looked at Pastor Kevin and said, hey, let's just pray for him. So we laid hands on him, and, um, and we prayed that if, if, if it were God's will, that he would be healed. But we also prayed that if that weren't the case, that he would be comforted in his presence, that Ed would be aware of God's presence with him, even in his suffering. We told him that we loved him, and we left expecting, fully expecting that the next call we'd get is that, you know, Ed had passed. So we were shocked when we got the call that he had recovered. So a couple days after that, I, I went down to visit him. And his wife Marjorie was there, and we talked and told him how happy I was to see him doing better. And she said, yeah, well, I bet you regret now disobeying the doctor's orders not to work in the yard. So apparently what had happened is he started coughing while he was working in the yard, and his lungs were already compromised, I think COPD. And he burst all these blood vessels uh, when the coughing got too violent, and he was effectively he was drowning in his own blood. So his response to her was something I'll never forget, though. He said, well, yes, I, I regret it, um, and no. I realized something when I thought I was dying. 
this is going to force my wife and my daughter to talk to one another for the first time in many, many years. So when the pastors came to pray, and he told me, yeah, I knew you guys were there. When they prayed for me, I clung to the prayer that I might recover. Not because I was afraid to die. I'm not afraid to die. I just wanted to see that miracle in person, that miracle of my wife and my daughter coming together again. So, of course, he regretted defying the doctor's orders not to overwork himself. But he didn't stay there, and that's the point. He didn't linger with the regret. Instead, he looked for the possibilities that, might, that God might work out of his circumstances. He had a vision of hope. In our story, the Hebrews believed that if this were God's will, everything should go peachy. Everything should be just fine. But here's the truth, and all of us already know this. Things don't always go great. (laughs) Very often they don't. And this was true for them as well. But God didn't lead them into the desert just to abandon them there. And he doesn't leave us in our own wilderness just to abandon us there. But he does allow for the circumstances of life to come and go, even random ones, because they provide opportunities to really grow. In the Exodus story, we see God doing something really profound with the people of Israel. He's shaping these slaves into free people. He works with us in a similar way, shaping us into free people. So he allows for these circumstances. And the other reason that he does this is that it, it, it makes sure that their dependence on him is revealed. It's really important. Nevertheless, the Israelites kept on complaining. They kept on blaming Moses and Aaron. So God had to pull something else out of his tool belt. And he does this with us as well. And that tool is his grace. So... They're complaining against Moses and Aaron. Moses goes to God for help. And despite the grumbling, which is, by the way, mentioned seven times in eight verses. So the the author definitely wanted us to know how bad the grumbling was. So God, nevertheless, feeds them. By his grace, he feeds these undeserving whiners. And when I read about that, I have to wonder, how many times has he done that for me? It's a good thing to think about. So God promises them meat and bread, and the meat came in the evening. That leads me to the second point. The adversities of this life provide opportunities to see God's faithfulness. This takes what the Bible refers to as patient endurance, or you could call it sacred remembrance. And it's symbolized very beautifully in the Exodus story by the blessings that Israel receives in the evening time an insight that I I borrowed from Pastor Larry. I thought it was a really cool insight. So in the evening, you'll, you'll know that it was the Lord that brought you out of Egypt. In other words, you'll know that it was the Lord being faithful despite your setbacks. Moses reminds them as they're grumbling, hey, It was God that brought you out here, not me. So I don't know why you're grumbling against me. In actuality, you're grumbling against him. But he's going to come through for you anyway. And he did. God sent quail, covered the entire camp, and they had an all-you-can-eat keto buffet, if you will. Just meat for everybody. In the evening, God, his grace brings about this satisfaction and this contentment that they were looking for. In the evening, they remembered that God, in fact, was the one that brought them out there. In our lives, we sometimes doubt. We might have regrets. We might be blaming others at our circumstances, complaining, criticizing. We fall into this if-only trap. But in the evening times, in other words, the quiet times, the times of reflection, doesn't have to literally be in the evening, but those times of reflection, we remember that it was the Lord that brought us through. And he can do it again. So in those times, we sense an important assurance from God. 
And it offsets the if-onlys in our lives. Because in those times of reflection and remembering, we see the mile markers of our faith, the mile markers of God's faithfulness. In the evening, we remember God's deliverance from things like self-reliance. Pure self-reliance comes with all kinds of fears. We become delivered from that when we remember that God brings us to these places. He brings us through these places. We can depend on him. He sets us free then to be a people of hope. And that leads me to this third point. There is promise for a hopeful tomorrow when you follow God's way. In the morning, it says, you will see the glory of God. I used to worry myself sick in second grade every Thursday night because on Friday morning, I had a spelling test. And I had gotten an A every single week of that school year. And now we were getting further and further into the school year. And so each week, the anxiety level got higher and higher because I wanted to make sure I had more stars than everybody else in the class. So my mom, finally, she says, this is getting out of hand. She comes to me and she says, honey, listen, I just want you to focus on this one thing. And if you'll do this, if you'll focus on this one thing until you fall asleep, you are going to feel so much better in the morning. I said, fine, what is it? She said, I love you. That's never going to change whether you get an A or you get an F. You're one of the neatest kids I've ever known. None of that's going to change whether you get an A or you get an F. Just relax. So I took her advice, fell asleep, and the next day I did feel better. I felt so much better that, in fact, I don't remember whether I got an A on that spelling test. And that's probably what mom was shooting for. So the Israelites, they feast on quail in the evening, but then the next day they get the bread. The thin dew covers the camp, and when it lifts, there's this flaky bread that's left on the, on the ground. I picture it like frosted flakes, because it says that it's, it tastes like coriander seed mixed with honey. So there's a principle here, because what Moses says is he says, you can go out and you can collect two liters for each family member, but it's only good for one day. If you keep it longer than that, it's going to rot. And so there's something to learn here, that he wants to show, and he desires this, he, he desires to reveal to us the reality of our dependence, you see, our dependence on him for the sustenance that we need to actually grow on our journey. Some of them ignored Moses, and so when they tried to keep it, just like he said, it was rotten the next day. So here's a truth that's important also. Before we can effectively follow his leading, we need to let go of something. We need to let go of that ego, that ego that says we know best. We need to let go of things like these silly notions of control where we don't actually have control. We need to be honest with ourselves, in other words. Just accept reality for what it is. It's not going to change because we insist that it's something that it isn't. See? So peace comes when I accept it for what it is. And then further peace occurs when I'm willing to let go of this purely self-made map for my life and adopt the principles that God has laid out for my life and live by those. So these are things that we can do. We can also remember intentionally those mile markers where God was faithful in our past. So then we can see with open eyes the blessings of God that come out of nowhere. We can see the glory of God, in other words. We can be encouraged by the promises that God gave us. In the morning, we can look toward the next wilderness that we have to enter with renewed hope and strength. God wants us to trust him. He wants us to realize that he's with us. He wants us to remember those mile markers of his faithfulness. Let's pray together. Father, as we reflect on our own journeys, we ask for eyes that are open to see your presence and leadership. We ask, Lord, that you would raise our awareness that we might grow to travel the remaining roads and highways, byways, wilderlands, 
with the peace that surpasses understanding and a joy overflowing. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand, I'd like to quickly share a closing story with you. Now, I want to remind you also that if you have need for prayer and you'd like to pray with someone or good people up front that would be happy to pray with you after service. Our youngest son, Joseph, uh, there are no words to describe how much joy he brings to my life. Uh, But this was not always the case. When Arlene began to feel like the Lord was calling us to adopt another child, I was extremely skeptical, and frankly, I was just, I was terrified. Uh, Arlene is usually right when she hears a calling, so I was scared. (laughs) So I, I could not see any sense in doing this. And one of my chief fears was that Ben might feel, um, he might feel like this kid took his place as the baby in the family. What would that do to him? I was worried about this. And besides that, I felt like we were just too old and we were definitely too poor. We didn't have a dime to put into another adoption and the process is expensive. So we had no money and, and there were just a lot of other reasons that didn't make any sense. Well, we fought about this again and again and again because Arlene had this pressure that she felt um, in this calling. So she got tired of fighting with me and she went to the Lord and she said, Lord, you gotta either take this off my heart or you gotta move it onto his because if this is you, he's gotta hear that. You gotta let him know, I can't do this anymore. I can't fight with him. So uh, the answer that she got was really surprising. He said, his name is Joseph. That was surprising for a couple of reasons. She was expecting to hear something like, okay, I'll put some pressure on Brett. Or, no, you're not really supposed to be doing this, Brett's right. Or something like that, you know. But the other thing that was surprising is she didn't like the name Joseph. I don't want to name whatever kid we adopt, Joseph. No offense to the Joes in the room, but she didn't like the name. So uh, she comes to me, though, and she says, I had this this prayer that I prayed, and, and it was to either take the burden off my heart or place it on yours, because I'm done fighting about this. I said, really? What would the Lord say? Well, it was kind of weird. He said, his name is Joseph. I said, okay. All right, well, like I said, we need to put this behind us. I'm tired of fighting about it too. So then I turned to my computer as though I were going to go back to work, but in secret, what I was doing is I was looking up the name Joseph, because I'm kind of freaking out. So remember I said that my chief fear was that bringing another child into the family would take something away from our relationship with Ben. Guess what the name Joseph means in Hebrew? God will add. So now I'm really freaking out. Still, like the Israelites, I resisted, kept on resisting. I told Arlene to to call Sharon Bradshaw, who was our social worker, and tell her that we need to be off the list of possible families. So Arlene did that. Months went by, we didn't talk about it, not one word, until one morning she wakes up suddenly and she says, I think I need to call Sharon Bradshaw. No, you don't need to call Sharon Bradshaw. We're going to breakfast. Pastor Kevin comes, picks us up, we're gonna have breakfast with him at Panera. We walk into Panera and guess who Arlene spots in Panera? Pastor Joe Bradshaw. He's talking to somebody in a booth, but we can't see who that is. So she's like, I bet that's Sharon. I said, no, it's probably not. Let's just go order. I'm going to order. So we, Kevin and I went and ordered, and we got a table. She comes back, and she says, it wasn't Sharon. I went, oh, thank God. So we have our breakfast. We're leaving. And uh, she says, but don't you think it's weird that I saw Joe here? and I really felt like I needed to call Sharon. I said, no, I don't think it's weird. I think you're hearing, you're seeing what you want to hear and see, okay? We need to get past this. No sooner had I finished saying that than her phone rings, and on the other line is Sharon Bradshaw. She said, I know that you're off the list. I'm sorry that I'm calling you, but I just, I can't get it off my mind. I had to call you guys. We've just found out about a four-year-old little boy He's going to be pushed out of the system when he reaches five. He's going to be on the streets. And I just couldn't get you guys out of my mind. And I could overhear some of the conversation, and I just felt the Holy Spirit saying, okay, this is what you got to do. So I said, tell Sharon that we're open to the possibilities. 
It wasn't too long after that that Sharon came to our house, sat down with us at our dining room table, pulled out a picture of the little boy, and she says, I'd like to introduce you to your son, Joseph. It wasn't that we were to name whoever we adopted Joseph. It's that God already knew the child and already knew his name was Joseph. He was just telling us to give me the courage I needed to move forward. I call that my burning bush experience. Well, we went to Africa. All the money came in to do that. Miraculously, I mean, seriously, I could go on and on, but I won't. I got to be honest with you, though, and tell you that the journey hasn't been easy. Joseph, it turns out, had a lot of problems that led to a lot of adversity, soul-shaping stuff that we would never have signed on for if we had expected it, but adversity that we would have never traded for anything nonetheless. He's taught me a lot through Joseph, probably most importantly, that if I always just had God meeting my expectations for this life, then I would miss out on the opportunities to see him exceed my expectations for this life. And that's faith, really. Accepting life for what it is and just clinging to the expectation that God's present in all of it and he can make good on all of it. So, leave here focused on your journey looking at the mile markers of his faithfulness and his love. Thanks for being here this morning.